Chapter Eighteen of the Directory of the Devout Life by F. B. Meyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Eighteen, to them that are without, Matthew Chapter Seven, verses one to six. As long as we are in this mortal life, we shall necessarily come into contact with those whose lives are godless and evil. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. People will always abound who will not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness. There will always be perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, and enemies to whatever is pure, lovely, holy, and of good report. In this paragraph of the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord sets himself to show us how to act towards such. It is clear that the Master had no desire that his servant should retire from human society, but should live amongst men as salt and light, arresting the progress of corruption and abashing the evil deeds that hide under the cover of darkness. But, in addition to the quiet influence of our character, there will always be scope for a further exercise of Christian principle. In what direction, and to what extent, is this to take effect, and by what laws is it to be governed? In answer to these questions, our Lord lays down a general principle, which is removed as far as possible from that which obtains among men. He says, Whatever you do, think, or say about others must be in precise accordance with what you would like them to do, think, or say about yourself. Judge not, for with what judgment ye judge ye shall be judged. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. All things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them, and all things whatsoever that ye would not that men should do unto you, do ye not so to them. It is clear that there are in this paragraph three circles of men with whom we are constantly thrown into contact. First, our associates and neighbors, whose characters and conduct are constantly passing in review before us. Secondly, the erring ones, whose motes trouble us. And thirdly, the dogs and swine, which stand for the notoriously vicious and profane. As to our associates and neighbors. 1. Our Lord says, Judge not. We need hardly say that there is a sense in which we are bound to form careful judgments on those around us. The judgment is one of the noblest faculties of our moral life, and our surest safeguard from the sharks that infest the seas. The young girl must use it, of the man who is seeking to engage her affections. The young man must use it, of the man who offers him a partnership. The seeker after truth must use it, of the teacher who professes to be able to lead him. There is no prayer that we need more often or more fervently to make than that God would give us right judgment in all things. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. But the judgment prohibited by our Lord is altogether different from this, and is the spirit of censoriousness and unkindness which is always lying in wait for others and making strong and uncharitable statements on the most superficial view of our words and actions without trying to understand the motives by which they have been actuated or the difficulties of their position. The natural man is proud, haughty, and self-opinionated. He has a great contempt of, and a great prejudice towards, those who do not belong to his own sect or party. He is, therefore, constantly on the watch for them, making faults where there are none, and aggravating them where there are. When he is formed, however hasty, his judgment he is not content with contemplating it for himself, but takes every opportunity of venting it in word and act. If such men can win another to their party, they are perfectly willing to condone his faults. Otherwise, they will not scruple to antagonize him and his influence by poisoning the minds of his neighbors and contemporaries. This sin of censorious judgment is a constant peril to us all, and one against which we need to watch and pray. Beware lest you have a secret joy in seeing that another who had borne an irreproachable character, has failed. Beware lest you base your estimate of another on idle stories, suspicions, suggestions, and surmises, without sufficient evidence. 
beware of seeking after a reputation for quickness in estimating the true worth of others since the desire to maintain such a reputation is fraught with temptation beware of speaking of the faults of others except you have prayed about them first beware of uttering your criticisms unless there is some end to be gained in warning others beware of speaking of others till you have looked at home remember the proverb about glass houses there are some who seem unable of forming a generous estimate of any according to them there is always some evil motive behind apparent goodness which detracts from all merit or virtues yes he does seem religious and humane but then you know there is a rich old relative in the background and it is all important to keep in touch with him and that sort of thing goes down well in that quarter or yes he is religious enough just now but you know there is a lady in the question and he is perfectly right in the way he is taking to win her ah it is a sad and miserable state of mind to have no eyes but for wounds and bruises and putrefying sores and to find these beneath the surface when they do not appear to the eyes of others there are many young men and women amongst us in society who can hardly indulge in any language but that of depreciation two our ignorance of most of the facts should give us pause before passing harsh and censorious judgments take this for instance a merchant was thought to be very selfish with his money he was known to be very rich and yet when asked for subscriptions he gave always a small sum five pounds where his neighbors thought he ought to give twenty pounds he was therefore in ill odor for miserliness and greed this went on for years and many closed their hearts against him one of his friends however who felt that there might be some other explanation set himself with careful inquiry to ascertain the facts it was with some difficulty that he finally discovered that this much abused man was supporting handsomely a large family of poor relatives he educated them well and put them out in life with no niggard hand they lived in another town and no one knew of the source of their income their benefactor never allowed his left hand to know what his right hand did here was a man whom all were misjudging because they did not know the full facts is it a solitary instance three the fact that we cannot judge others adversely without revealing ourselves may also make us hesitate the man who imputes low motives to the conduct of another is probably conscious of their presence within himself he is already actuated by them or would be if he were in the place of the man he criticizes he has no higher standard for another than that which rules in his own breast and almost unconsciously in his criticisms he is revealing his secret soul four it is inevitable that our harsh judgments of others will come back on ourselves a man receives back what he gives there is an automatic law of compensation in society kindness begets kindness censoriousness begets censoriousness ishmael's hand was against every one and every man's hand was against him Adonabazek cut off the thumbs and great toes of seventy kings, and as it was done by him, it was done to him. Haman was hanged on the gallows which he had erected for Mordecai. The Jew, who banned all men as heathen dogs, is himself banned. The world may be fitly compared to a vast field in which each man drops his seed, and it comes back to him not just the same as it was when he dropped it, any more than in the autumn you reap from the earth the black berry which you hid in the broad bosom of the spring but something which has its true correspondence in proportion to that every gift has its return every act its rebound every voice its echo the lord states the alternative in another discourse closely corresponding to this when he says give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom for with the same measure that ye meet with all it shall be measured to you again wherefore judge nothing before the time until the lord come who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall each man have his praise from god first corinthians chapter four verse five revised version especially guard against prejudice that is prejudgment remember that there are dogs and swine in the make-up of your own heart 
and you must see to it that their presence does not trample under feet what is purest noblest and best and rend men and women who if you but knew and understood them more fully would attract your loving veneration remember the words with which our lord prefaced his warning against censorious judgment be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful as to the erring one consider the beam that is in your own eye the beam is of course a log rafter or joist and is the extreme contrast to the chip or splint of wood which is light enough to float in the air and a child can understand what our lord means when he employs a well-known jewish proverb to give the flavor of homeliness to his speech two by nature we are extremely prone to put other people right we behold the mote that is in our brother's eye till we can think of nothing else all the good qualities he possesses weigh lighter than the swan's down against that one inconsistency which presents itself to us at each mention of his name finally we go to him with a fixed resolve of riddling him of his moat saying let me pull out the moat that is in thine eye now in all this there would be nothing to condemn indeed there would be much to condemn if it were not done lovingly humbly and after the due confession and putting away from our own life of all inconsistency and sin but it is the height of absurdity to attempt to extract the mote when your own vision is distorted by the presence of the unextracted beam how dare you presume to deal with the faultiness of others when your own faults have not been corrected it is like satan rebuking sin well may men cry physician heal thyself three it is evidently a very delicate operation to correct the faults of others our lord compares it to the extraction of a little piece of grit or dust or a minute insect from an inflamed eye a clumsy hand may easily make the matter worse only the tenderest strongest hand can be trusted for the operation and if i might choose let me have one who has himself suffered being tempted it is only he who has been tempted in all points like as we are though without sin who can be trusted to deal with our inner temptations inconsistencies and failures it is the man whose own transgressions have been forgiven according to the multitude of god's tender mercies who can teach transgressors his ways four first cast out the beam out of thine own eye there is a beam there if only you knew it we look it has been said at our neighbor's errors with a microscope but at our own through the wrong end of a telescope we have two sets of weights and measures one for home use and the other for foreign every vice has two names and we call it by the flattering and minimizing one when we commit it and by the ugly one when our neighbor does everybody can see the hump on his friend's shoulders but it takes some effort to see our own a blind guide is bad enough but a blind oculist is a still more ridiculous anomaly the more we know of ourselves the more pitiful we shall be of others the less likely to form rash and harsh judgments the more sweet and tender we shall be in trying to make men better five then thou shalt see clearly only the pure heart sees and when once some heart sin is put away a flood of light pours on all things in heaven and on earth we see sin as we never saw it and the love of god and the grace of our lord jesus christ heaven above is softer blue earth around is sweeter green something shines in every hue christless eyes have never seen birds with gladder songs o'erflow flowers with brighter beauty shine while christ whispers in my ear i am his and he is mine as to dogs and swine use a wise discrimination suppose a priest on coming out of the temple encounters a hungry dog one of those yelping voracious unclean animals which are the scavengers and pests of oriental cities would it be seemly for him to return to the temple take a piece of the flesh which was reserved from the sacrifices for the use of priests and therefore holy and give it to the dog for food he might relieve the creature's hunger but not with such food as that or suppose a man carrying a bag of pearls through a forest were to encounter a hog 
would it be wise or seemly for him to place the pearls before it when it needed acorns similarly it is unseemly to offer the sacraments of our holy religion or the forgiveness of christ's gospel to the notoriously unclean and untrue or to discuss the sacred mysteries of the epistle to the ephesians with those who are set on coarse and carnal pleasures their natures must first be changed they must be born from above old things must pass away and all things become new then when the heart of stone has been removed and the heart of flesh substituted the soul will hunger after the divine mysteries and will be able to appreciate them in such a way as to justify us in presenting them the raven may feed on carrion but the dove will return to noah's ark until she can find her natural food for all this we need something which was not fully revealed when our lord was speaking but has been revealed since the soul which stands before this high ideal is filled with despair until it remembers first that the precious blood cleanses from all sin and shortcoming and second that the holy spirit longs to make possible and real these heavenly ideals may that blood cleanse and that spirit renew and perfect thee and me End of chapter 18